The Story of Bailbrow by Kay and Hesketh Pritchard Read by Lorraine Kearney It is a matter for regret that so many of Mr Flaxman Lowe's reminiscences should deal with the darker episodes of his career. Yet this is almost unavoidable, as the more purely scientific and less strongly marked cases would not perhaps contain the same elements of interest for the general public, however valuable and instructive they might be to the expert student. It has also been considered better to choose the completer cases, those that ended in something like satisfactory proof, rather than the many instances where the thread broke off abruptly amongst surmisings which it was never possible to subject to convincing tests. North of a low-lying strip of country on the East Anglian coast, the promontory of Bale Ness thrusts out a blunt nose into the sea. On the Ness, backed by pine woods, stands a square, comfortable stone mansion known to the countryside as Bellbrow. It has faced the east winds for close upon 300 years and during the whole period has been the home of the Swaffham family, who were never in any wise put out of conceit of their ancestral dwelling by the fact that it had always been haunted. Indeed, the Swathams were proud of the Bailbrow ghost, which enjoyed a wide notoriety, and no one dreamt of complaining of its behaviour until Professor Jungvort of Nuremberg laid information against it and sent an urgent appeal for help to Mr Flaxman Lowe. The Professor, who was well acquainted with Mr Lowe, detailed the circumstances of his tenancy of Bailbrow and the unpleasant events that had followed thereupon. It appeared that Mr Swaffham Sr., who spent a large portion of his time abroad, had offered to lend his house to the Professor for the summer season. When the young forts arrived at Bailbrow, they were charmed with the place. The prospect, though not very varied, was at least extensive and the air exhilarating. Also, the professor's daughter enjoyed frequent visits from her betrothed, Harold Swaffham, and the professor was delightfully employed in overhauling the Swaffham library. The young forts had been duly told of the ghost, which lent distinction to the old house, but never in any way interfered with the comfort of its inmates. For some time, they found this description to be strictly true, but with the beginning of October came a change. Up to this time, and as far back as the Swaffham annals reached, the ghost had been a shadow, a rustle, a passing sigh, nothing definite or troublesome. But early in October, strange things began to occur, and the terror culminated when a housemaid was found dead in a corridor three weeks later. Upon this, the professor felt that it was time to send for Flaxman Lowe. Mr Lowe arrived upon a chilly evening, when the house was already beginning to blur in the purple twilight, and the resinous scent of the pines came sweetly on the land breeze. Jungfort welcomed him in the spacious, firelit hall. He was a stout German with a quantity of white hair, round eyes emphasised by spectacles and a kindly, dreamy face. His life study was philology and his two relaxations, chess and the smoking of a big Bismarck bold Meerschaum. Now, Professor, said Mr Lowe when they had settled themselves in the smoking room, how did it all begin? I will tell you replied Jongvort, thrusting out his chin and tapping his broad chest and speaking as if an unwarrantable liberty had been taken with him. First of all, it has shown itself to me. Mr Flaxman Low smiled and assured him that nothing could be more satisfactory. But not at all satisfactory, exclaimed the professor. I was sitting here alone. It might have been midnight, when I hear something come creeping like a little dog with its nails tick, tick upon the oak flooring of the hall. I whistle, 
for I think it is the little rags of my daughter, and afterwards opened the door, and I saw... He hesitated, and looked hard at Lo through his spectacles. Something that was just disappearing into the passage which connects the two wings of the house. It was a figure, not unlike the human figure, but narrow and straight. I fancied I saw a bunch of black hair and a flutter of something detached which may have been a handkerchief. I was overcome by a feeling of repulsion. I heard a few clicking steps which stopped, as I thought, at the museum door. Come, I will show you the spot. The professor conducted Mr Lowe into the hall. The main staircase, dark and massive, yawned above them and directly behind it ran the passage referred to by the professor. It was over twenty feet long and about midway led past a deep arch containing a door reached by two steps. Jungfurt explained that this door formed the entrance to a large room called the museum in which Mr Swarfham Senior, who was something of a dilettante, stored the various curios he picked up during his excursions abroad. The professor went on to say that he immediately followed the figure which he believed had gone into the museum, but he found nothing there except the cases containing Swaffham's treasures. I mentioned my experience to no one. I concluded that I had seen the ghost. But two days after, one of the female servants coming through the passage in the dark declared that a man leapt out at her from the embrasure of the museum door. But she released herself and ran screaming into the servants' hall. We at once made a search, but found nothing to substantiate her story. I took no notice of this, though it coincided pretty well with my own experience. The week after, my daughter Lena came down late one night for a book. As she was about to cross the hall, something leapt upon her from behind. Women are of little use in serious investigations. She fainted. Since then, she's been ill, and the doctor says, run down. Here, the professor spread out his hands. So she leaves for a change tomorrow. Since then, other members of the household have been attacked in much the same manner, with always the same result. They faint and are weak and useless when they recover. But last Wednesday, the affair became a tragedy. By that time, the servants had refused to come through the passage except in a crowd of three or four, most of them preferring to go round by the terrace to reach this part of the house. But one maid, named Eliza Freeman, said she was not afraid of the Bailbrow ghost and undertook to put out the lights in the hall one night. When she had done so and was returning through the passage past the museum door, she appears to have been attacked or at any rate frightened. In the grey of the morning, they found her lying beside the steps, dead. There was a little blood upon her sleeve, but no mark upon her body except a small raised pustule under the ear. The doctor said the girl was extraordinarily anemic and that she probably died from fright, her heart being weak. I was surprised at this, for she had always seemed to be a particularly strong and active young woman. Can I see Miss Youngvort tomorrow before she goes? asked Lo, as the professor signified he had nothing more to tell. The professor was rather unwilling that his daughter should be questioned, but at last gave his permission, and next morning Lo had a short talk with the girl before she left the house. He found her a very pretty girl, though listless and startlingly pale, and with a frightened stare in her light brown eyes. Mr Lowe asked if she could describe her assailant. No, she answered. I could not see him, for he was behind me. I only saw a dark, bony hand with shining nails and a bandaged arm pass just under my eyes before I fainted. Bandaged arm? I have heard nothing of this. Tut, tut, mere fancy, put in the professor impatiently. I saw the bandages on the arm, repeated the girl, 
turning her head wearily away, and I smelt the antiseptics it was dressed with. You have hurt your neck, remarked Mr. Lowe, who noticed a small circular patch of pink under her ear. She flushed and paled, raising her hand to her neck with a nervous jerk, as she said in a low voice. It has almost killed me. Before he touched me, I knew he was there. I felt it. When they left her, the professor apologised for the unreliability of her evidence and pointed out the discrepancy between her statement and his own. She says she has seen nothing but an arm. Yet I tell you, it had no arms. Preposterous. Conceive a wounded man entering this house to frighten the young women. I do not know what to make of it. Is it a man or is it the Balebrow ghost? During the afternoon, when Mr Lowe and the professor returned from a stroll on the shore, they found a dark-browed young man with a bull neck and strongly marked features standing sullenly before the hall fire. The professor presented him to Mr Lowe as Harold Swaffham. Swaffham seemed to be about 30, but was already known as a far-seeing and successful member of the Stock Exchange. I am pleased to meet you, Mr Lowe, he began with a keen glance, though you don't look sufficiently high-strung for one of your profession. Mr Lowe merely bowed. Come, you don't defend your craft against my insinuations, went on Swaffham, and so you are here to rout out our poor old ghost from Balebrow. You forget that he is an heirloom, a family possession. What's this about his having turned rabid, eh, Professor? He ended, wheeling round upon Jungfurt in his brusque way. The Professor told the story over again. It was plain that he stood rather in awe of his prospective son-in-law. I heard much the same from Lena, whom I met at the station, said Swaffham. It is my opinion that the women in this house are suffering from an epidemic of hysteria. You agree with me, Mr Lowe? Possibly, though hysteria could hardly account for Freeman's death. I can't say as to that until I have looked further into the particulars. I've not been idle since I arrived. I have examined the museum. No one has entered it from the outside, and there is no other way of entrance except through the passage. The flooring is laid, I happen to know, on a thick layer of concrete, and there the case for the ghost stands at present. After a few moments of dogged reflection, he swung round on Mr Lowe, in a manner that seemed peculiar to him when about to address any person. What do you say to this plan, Mr Lowe? I propose to drive the professor over to Ferryvale to stop there for a day or two at the hotel and I will also dispose of the servants who still remain in the house for, say, 48 hours. Meanwhile, you and I can try to go further into the secret of the ghost's new pranks. Flaxman Lowe replied that this scheme exactly met his views but the professor protested against being sent away. Harold Swaffham, however, was a man who liked to arrange things in his own fashion, and within 45 minutes he and Jungfort departed in the dogcart. The evening was lowering, and Balebrow, like all houses built in exposed situations, was extremely susceptible to the changes of the weather. Therefore, before many hours were over, the place was full of creaking noises as the screaming gale battered at the shuttered windows and the tree branches tapped and groaned against the walls. Harold Swaffham, on his way back, was caught in the storm and drenched to the skin. It was therefore settled that after he had changed his clothes, he should have a couple of hours rest on the smoking room sofa while Mr Lowe kept watch in the hall. The early part of the night passed over uneventfully. A light burned faintly in the great wainscoted hall, but the passage was dark. There was nothing to be heard but the wild moan and whistle of the wind coming in from the sea and the squalls of rain dashing against the windows. As the hours advanced, Mr Lowe lit a lantern that lay at hand and carrying it along the passage, 
tried the museum door. It yielded, and the wind came muttering through to meet him. He looked round at the shutters and behind the big cases which held Mr. Swaffham's treasures to make sure that the room contained no living occupant but himself. Suddenly, he fancied he heard a scraping noise behind him and turned round, but discovered nothing to account for it. Finally, he laid the lantern on a bench so that its light should fall through the door into the passage and returned again to the hall where he put out the lamp and then once more took up his station by the closed door of the smoking room. A long hour passed, during which the wind continued to roar down the wide hall chimney and the old boards creaked as if furtive footsteps were gathering from every corner of the house. But Flaxman, though, he did none of these things. He was waiting for a certain sound. After a while, he heard it, the cautious scraping of wood on wood. He leant forward to watch the museum door. Click, click, came the curious dog-like tread upon the tiled floor of the museum, till the thing, whatever it was, paused and listened behind the open door. The wind lulled at the moment, and Lo listened also, but no further sound was to be heard, only slowly across the broad ray of light falling through the door grew a stealthy shadow. Again the wind rose and blew in heavy gusts about the house till even the flame and the lantern flickered, but when it steadied once more, Flaxman Lowe saw that the silent form had passed through the door and was now on the steps outside. He could just make out a dim shadow in the dark angle of the embrasure. Presently, from the shapeless shadow came a sound Mr Lowe was not prepared to hear. The thing sniffed the air with the strong, audible inspiration of a bear or some large animal. At the same moment, carried on the draughts of the hall, a faint, unfamiliar odour reached his nostrils. Lena Youngwart's words flashed back upon him. This, then, was the creature with the bandaged arm. Again, as the storm shrieked and shook the windows, a darkness passed across the light. The thing had sprung out from the angle of the door, and Flaxman Lowe knew that it was making its way towards him through the elusive blackness of the hall. He hesitated for a second. Then he opened the smoking room door. Harold Swaffham sat up on the sofa, dazed with sleep. What has happened? Has it come? Lowe told him what he had just seen. Swaffham listened half-smilingly. What do you make of it now? he said. I must ask you to defer that question for a little, replied Lo. Then you mean me to suppose that you have a theory to fit all these incongruous items? I have a theory which may be modified by further knowledge, said Lo. Meantime, am I right in concluding from the name of this house that it was built on a barrel or burying place? You are right, though that has nothing to do with the latest freaks of our ghost, returned Swaffham decidedly. I also gather that Mr. Swaffham has lately sent home one of the many cases now lying in the museum, went on Mr. Lowe. He sent one, certainly, last September. And you have opened it, asserted Lowe. Yes, though I flattered myself I had left no trace of my handiwork. I have not examined the cases, said Lowe. I inferred that you had done so from other facts. Now, one thing more, went on Swaffham, still smiling. Do you imagine there is any danger? I mean to men like ourselves. Hysterical women cannot be taken into serious account. Certainly. The gravest danger to any person who moves about this part of the house alone after dark, replied Lowe. Harold Swaffham leant back and crossed his legs. To go back to the beginning of our conversation, Mr Lowe, 
May I remind you of the various conflicting particulars you will have to reconcile before you can present any decent theory to the world? I am quite aware of that. First of all, our original ghost was a mere misty presence, rather guessed at from vague sounds and shadows. Now we have a something that is tangible, and that can, as we have proof, kill with fright. Next, Jungvort declares the thing was a narrow, long and distinctly armless object, while Miss Jungvort has not only seen the arm and hand of a human being, but saw them clearly enough to tell us that the nails were gleaming and the arm bandaged. She also felt its strength. Jungvort, on the other hand, maintained that it clicked along like a dog. You bear out this description with the additional information that it sniffs like a wild beast. Now what can this thing be? It is capable of being seen, smelt and felt, yet it hides itself successfully in a room where there is no cavity or space sufficient to afford covert to a cat. You still tell me that you believe that you can explain? Most certainly, replied Flaxman Lowe with conviction. I have not the slightest intention or desire to be rude, but as a mere matter of common sense, I must express my opinion plainly. I believe the whole thing to be the result of excited imaginations, and I am about to prove it. Do you think there is any further danger tonight? Very great danger tonight, replied Lowe. Very well, as I said, I am going to prove it. I will ask you to allow me to lock you up in one of the distant rooms, where I can get no help from you, and I will pass the remainder of the night walking about the passage and hall in the dark. That should give proof, one way or the other. You can do so if you wish, but I must at least beg to be allowed to look on. I will leave the house and watch what happens from the window in the passage, which I saw opposite the museum door. You cannot, in any fairness, refuse to let me be a witness. I cannot, of course, returned Swaffham. Still, the night is too bad to turn a dog out into, and I warn you that I shall lock you out. That will not matter. Lend me a Macintosh and leave the lantern lit in the museum where I placed it. Swaffham agreed to this. Mr Lowe gives a graphic account of what followed. He left the house and was duly locked out, and after groping his way round by the walls, found himself at length outside the window of the passage, which was almost opposite to the door of the museum. The door was still ajar, and a thin band of light cut out into the gloom. Further down, the hall gaped, black and void. Lo, sheltering himself as well as he could from the rain, waited for Swaffham's appearance. Was the terrible yellow watcher balancing itself upon its lean legs in the dim corner opposite, ready to spring out with its deadly strength upon the passer-by? Presently, Lowe heard a door bang inside the house, and the next moment Swaffham appeared with a candle in his hand, an isolated spread of weak rays against the vast darkness behind. He advanced steadily down the passage, his dark face grim and set, and as he came, Mr Lowe experienced that tingling sensation which is so often the forerunner of some strange experience. Swaffham passed on towards the other end of the passage. There was a quick vibration of the museum door as a lean shape with a shrunken head leapt out into the passage after him. Then altogether came a hoarse shout, the noise of a fall and utter darkness. In an instant, Mr Lowe had broken the glass, opened the window and swung himself into the passage. There he lit a match and as it flared, he saw by its dim light a picture painted for a second upon the obscurity beyond. Swaffham's big figure lay with outstretched arms, face downwards, and as Lowe looked, a crouching shape extricated itself from the fallen man, raising a narrow, vicious head from his shoulder. 
The match spluttered feebly and went out, and Law heard a flying step click on the boards before he could find the candle Swaffham had dropped. Lighting it, he stooped over Swaffham and turned him on his back. The man's strong colour had gone, and the wax-white face looked whiter still against the blackness of hair and brows, and upon his neck, under the ear, was a little raised pustule from which a thin line of blood was streaked up to the angle of his cheekbone. Some instinctive feeling prompted Low to glance up at this moment. Half extended from the museum doorway were a face and bony neck, a high-nosed, dull-eyed, malignant face, the eye sockets hollow and the darkened teeth showing. Low plunged his hand into his pocket and a shot rang out in the echoing passageway and hall. The wind sighed through the broken panes. A ribbon of stuff fluttered along the polished flooring, and that was all. As Flaxman Low half dragged, half carried Swaffham into the smoking room. It was some time before Swaffham recovered consciousness. He listened to Lowe's story of how he had found him with an angry gleam in his sombre eyes. The ghost has scored off me, he said with an odd, sullen laugh. But now I fancy it's my turn. But before we adjourn to the museum to examine the place, I will ask you to let me hear your notion of things. You've been right in saying there was real danger. For myself, I can only tell you that I felt something spring upon me, and I knew no more. Had this not happened, I am afraid I should never have asked you a second time what your idea of the matter might be. He ended with a sort of sulky frankness. There are two main indications, replied Lowe. This strip of yellow bandage, which I have just now picked up from the passage floor, and the mark on your neck. What's that you say? Swaffham rose quickly and examined his neck in a small glass beside the mantel shelf. Connect those two, and I think I can leave you to work it out for yourself, said Lowe. Pray let us have your theory in full, requested Swaffham shortly. Very well, answered Lowe good-humouredly. He thought Swaffham's annoyance natural under the circumstances. The long, narrow figure, which seemed to the professor to be armless, is developed on the next occasion. For Miss Youngfort sees a bandaged arm and a dark hand with gleaming, which means, of course, gilded nails. The clicking sound of the footsteps coincides with these particulars, for we know that sandals made of strips of leather are not uncommon in company with gilt fingernails and bandages. Old and dry leather would naturally click upon your polished floors. Bravo, Mr Lowell. So you mean to say that this house is haunted by a mummy? That is my idea, and all I have seen confirms me in my opinion. To do you justice, you held this theory before tonight, before in fact you had seen anything for yourself. You gathered that my father had sent home a mummy, and you went on to conclude that I had opened the case. Yes. I imagine you took off most of, or rather all, the outer bandages, thus leaving the limbs free, wrapped only in the inner bandages which were swathed round each separate limb. I fancy this mummy was preserved on the Theban method, with aromatic spices, which left the skin olive-coloured, dry and flexible, like tanned leather, the features remaining distinct, and the hair, teeth and eyebrows perfect. So far good, said Swaffham, but now how about the intermittent vitality? The pustule on the neck of those whom it attacks, and where is our old bell-brow ghost to come in? Swaffham tried to speak in a rallying tone, but his excitement and lowering temper were visible enough, in spite of the attempts he made to suppress them. To begin at the beginning, said Flaxman Low, everybody who in a rational and honest manner investigates the phenomena of spiritism will sooner or later meet in them some perplexing element which is not to be explained by any of the ordinary theories. 
For reasons into which I need not now enter, this present case appears to me to be one of these. I am led to believe that the ghost which has for so many years given dim and vague manifestations of its existence in this house is a vampire. Swaffham threw back his head with an incredulous gesture. We no longer live in the Middle Ages, Mr Lowe. And besides, how could a vampire come here? He said scoffingly. It is held by some authorities on these subjects that under certain conditions a vampire may be self-created. You tell me that this house is built upon an ancient barrow, in fact on a spot where we might naturally expect to find such an elemental psychic germ. In those dead human systems were contained all the seeds for good and evil. The power which causes these psychic seeds or germs to grow is thought, and from being long dwelt on and indulged, a thought might finally gain a mysterious vitality which could go on increasing more and more by attracting to itself suitable and appropriate elements from its environment. For a long period, this germ remained a helpless intelligence awaiting the opportunity to assume some material form by means of which to carry out its desires. The invisible is the real. The material only subserves its manifestation. The impalpable reality already existed when you provided for it a physical medium for action by unwrapping the mummy's form. Now we can only judge of the nature of the germ by its manifestation through matter. Here we have every indication of a vampire intelligence touching into life and energy the dead human frame. Hence the mark on the neck of its victims and their bloodless and anemic condition. For a vampire, as you know, sucks blood. Swaffham rose and took up the lamp. Now for proof he said bluntly. Wait a second, Mr. Lowe. You say you fired at this appearance? And he took up the pistol which Lowe had laid down on the table. Yes, I aimed at a small portion of its foot which I saw on the step. Without more words and with the pistol still in his hand, Swaffham led the way to the museum. The wind howled round the house and the darkness which precedes the dawn lay upon world when the two men looked upon one of the strangest sights it has ever been given to men to shudder at. Half in and half out of an oblong wooden box, in a corner of the great room, lay a lean shape in its rotten yellow bandages, the scraggy neck surmounted by a mop of frizzled hair. The toe strap of a sandal and a portion of the right foot had been shot away. Swatham, with a working face, gazed down at it, then seizing it by its tearing bandages, he flung it into the box, where it fell into a lifelike posture, its wide, moist-lipped mouth gaping up at them. For a moment, Swatham stood over the thing. Then, with a curse, he raised the revolver and shot into the grinning face again and again with a deliberate vindictiveness. Finally, he rammed the thing down into the box and, clubbing the weapon, smashed the head into fragments with a vicious energy that coloured the whole horrible scene with a suggestion of murder done. Then, turning to Lowe, he said, Help me to fasten the cover on it. Are you going to bury it? No, we must rid the earth of it, he answered savagely. I'll put it into the old canoe and burn it. The rain had ceased when in the daybreak they carried the old canoe down to the shore. In it they placed the mummy case with its ghastly occupant and piled faggots about it. The sail was raised and the pile lighted and Lowe and Swaffham watched it creep out on the ebb tide. At first a twinkling spark, then a flare of waving fire until far out to sea the history of that dead thing ended 3,000 years after the priests of Amen had laid it to rest in its appointed pyramid. End of the story of Bale Brown. 